remainder of the group arrives. Um, let people know. Um, so um, we're going to uh, use this opportunity to uh, talk about the representation of, of stochastic processes. So um, when we have uncertainty over time, we speak about there being stochastics. And frequently, um, there's a variety of factors that may be exogenous to models that will consider um, stochastic. Things like stock market, uh, values of prices in the stock market, oil prices, rainfall, um, even aspects of economic growth. And what's considered stochastic um, and, and deterministic is often a matter of the, the scope of the model. Um, in any logic, agent-based modeling and discrete event models are typically stochastic. System dynamics models in any logic and in other packages may be stochastic, although they're most commonly deterministic. Agent-based models and discrete event models are, are stochastic um, in part because there's uh, stochastic transitions between states. So there's a certain rate of, of going from one state to the other, for example, um, because firing of uh, of events um, may be done at a, at a sort of rate type of level, like for immigration. Messages um, may, be, uh, may be sent to randomly selected neighbors. And sometimes the duration of procedures, for example, in, in discrete event modeling, this process-centric modeling, may be stochastic, may be uncertain. Um, as a result, there's going to be variation results from simulation to simulation, or as we say, from realization to realization. So to gain confidence in the results of a model, which exhibits this variability, um, typically the approach that's undertaken is the Monte Carlo one. So we typically um, you know, run, run the model on an ensemble of, of realization, a collection of different runs, each of which make use of different randomly generated sequences. absolute terms of how does this intervention compare with that one. You're talking about a distribution of differences between those inter, uh, interventions. So, um, so running this ensemble of realizations is called a Monte, uh, it's, it's, it's a Monte Carlo um, type procedure. Uh, we're running the model uh, again and again and again uh, with different random number seeds and securing different results each time. Um, now, uh, when summarizing these things, th these results, we often have to make use of some specialized, um, uh, specialized uh, features within any logic or some specialized components within any logic. And specifically, there's, um, rather than displaying each trajectory in sort of isolation and just, just drawing each trajectory out over time, quickly get get messy um, and get overwhelming to the eyes when you start having hundreds of these trajectories. Instead what's common 
commonly done is to construct a history frame. Um, you, you can do this, and, and there are, and any logic does support this uh, to a point. You can, and, and there's two forms in which you can summarize this. One is, is uh, histogram 2D, so here you create successive histograms at different um, points, and uh, for a given point in time, there's kind of a histogram uh, that approximates some this underlying distribution associated with the values, and um, sometimes the histogram may be more tight than others, um, and uh, sometimes it may be very broad, sometimes it's bimodal, etc. Um, and it turns out there's two ways of summarizing uh, those histograms we'll be talking about with envelopes and with uh, more specifically with just bin bin counts. So um, let's let's go to the model we're working with to, to make this a little bit more concrete. And uh, this is this SAR agent-based calibration model. And I'd like you to right-click on this Monte Carlo 2D histogram. Um, that's below, uh, below there. It's the last one within this model. Okay, um, raise your hand if you need TA help with this at all. This is this model SIR agent-based calibration. That's within the or the, uh, the SIR agent-based calibration is within the. Uh, if you were to do help uh, example models, it's. Uh, oh wait, that's the one we were working with earlier. It's it, it, but for those who, who do need to find it, it's it's right here. Um, Jeff, I'm not sure what robot for Gollum manufacturing is. <laughs> um, maybe one of those uniquely Russian things. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure. Um, okay, so so we've just uh, we just want to run that that last um, that last. Uh, run here and we want to run a uh, hundred replications so this is a hundred realizations of this model and it's running out again and again and you can see this is this model of infection spread we did so this uh, spatial model um, and it's running with the same set of parameters but you'll notice that it's exhibiting some variability so what what this graph represents this is what we call a Monte Carlo 2D histogram uh, it divides time up into a set of intervals. And for each of those intervals, conceptually, there's a histogram here occurring. If you think of this as a slice at time 40, there's a histogram here. So it's, it's high initially, and then maybe it goes low, and then it goes high again, and then low. Okay. So every time, you could slice and create a histogram, and the value is viewed as falling into a set of bins. Um, so you can see there's a certain amount of, of uh, variability. You notice it's running on multiple cores here, and uh, it's running on 200 simulations. So um, it could be counting up to 200. And this can give you some sense of the variability elicited from this model um, uh, because of stochastics. Again, not changing any parameters here, running the model with the same set of parameters, just with different random number seeds, and that induces variability in them. And the output simply due to the vagaries of who infects who. And you'll notice that that conjecture we had earlier, that observation, is borne out here. That a fair number of runs seem to have no takeoff of infection at, at all. There's a, there's a notable line, line even through this region. What's less certain, though, is is it possible this goes up and some of them come down here, and then others just go up late, later, and that's why we see this sort of this light line. We're not we're not sure that a particular trajectory stays down here, but we do know that there's a fair number that are zero even at even at that point. This particular representation abstracts away from particular trajectories. It's more showing the statistics across trajectories. Um, it's more of a cross-sectional depiction in that in that sense. So um, let's talk about this more. This Monte Carlo 2D histogram. So here, time is divided up the user-specified number of intervals, and we divide up the value axis into a user-specified number of intervals, and they define a uniform 2D grid, and it accumulates data regarding how many trajectories include a given for a given interval of time. How many of those trajectories include a value within? vertical uh, value interval, okay? Um, 
so um, let, let's go um, let's go take a look at this uh, more closely so um, let's, let's go to the model itself and take a look at how this is defined um, so what we see here is a parameter variation experiment okay um, and we have um, some assumptions specified for these parameters and we say um, each run should be, have a unique random number seed. This, this exercise wouldn't, really wouldn't have much value if we used the same seed over and over and over again. Um, and um, that's, so this, this uh, experiment is, is running it many times. And uh, depending on your parameters, you may get um, uh, different, your parameters uh, assumptions, but you may get variability around the, around the mean. Let's go take a look at, at how this works a little bit. So we have, if we, if we click here, we have this output surface, which is called a, a chart histogram 2D. But what it depends on is this data infectious 2D, okay, which is located over here. And actually, you'll find it to the left. You'll note that quite a few models that are packaged with any logic of sample models have the, the plumbing over here to the left. And the reason is because they don't want it to be cluttering up the screen when you're running the model. And it's, it's a quite good idea, frankly. Um, so, so there's machinery to left. And if you, um, if you were to scroll over, um, actually, so I guess this doesn't support, um, support scrolling. We'd have to uh, see if we can, um, uh, if we can uh, get that to support it. But in any case, it's over here to the left, so you can't really uh, can't really see it with the default uh, with the default view, um, and what it depends on particularly is this uh, is this data set data infectious 2D, okay, um, and data infectious 2D uh, specifies uh, some parameters: the number of horizontal in uh, intervals and vertical intervals. So for each of these horizontal intervals, there'll be this histogram accumulated within these vertical intervals, okay. Um, so uh, this 2D um, histogram data is what's responsible for, 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 um, for accumulating things. Um, so you know, here there's 40 intervals from a lower value of 0 to an upper value of 4,000. Okay? Um, and uh, it also defines some envelopes, which we'll be talking about the implications of that in a, in a bit. Okay? Yes? That's correct, yeah. So, say I wanted to do it by
separately. I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to do it right now, but I'll try to weave it in if I can. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it may be a, a better fit even to our calibration lecture. If you were to read the exercise on calibration, um, uh, that might also help you understand how to do that, okay? But it's readily done. And, and the key point here is, and, and this is going to require changing some assumptions about things. This is what's called a parameter variation experiment. And this, this other one is a calibration optimization experiment, okay? Um, what's different about these two types of experiments than our simple experiment is that they, these experiments consist of more than one realization of the model. They actually run the model many times each. They, they last longer than does the, uh, the main class itself, than does the execution of a given run. So this might run the model 100 times, 1,000 times, and it accumulates data from each one, and, and it accumulates it in the traditional mechanisms that we've been taught about. So things like uh, variables or data sets, and you can have charts there, et cetera. Um, but within the scope of this is many runs of the model, many particular runs of the model. Same thing with the calibration. It's, it's adjusting the parameters and trying to find the best fit, and it's running the model many times. Previously, we had always dealt with kind of one-shot experiments, which run the model once, they kind of create the main, pass it some information as specified maybe by the user interface of that, uh, of that experiment, or maybe as specified by the, by the um, information uh, provided here for the parameters. It just gives that to main, main runs, and then it finishes and it's done. This one runs main many, many times. So main is getting created, running, and data is being salvaged from it, and then it's disappearing for each of these. So what you would need to do is to salvage that data, okay? And it's actually going to be a pretty easy thing. Um, so we'll see if we can, um, we can weave it in. Um, Okay, so um, so uh, stochastics here. I'd like to talk a little bit about any logics terminology here, um, and uh, the terminology, unfortunately, in any logic is is um, a bit confusing and, truth be told, a bit inconsistent at times. So you have to be a little bit careful um, how you use these things. Um, so many modelers use the term. Uh, ensemble and realization. Ensemble to refer to a collection of realizations. Each realization involving a single single um, instance of this stochastic process, a single run of the model in this case. Um, in any logic, replication is used to mean one run of the model. A simulation is a collection of replications um, that can yield findings across the set of replications. And an experiment is a collection of simulations. So this may seem an arbitrary hierarchy, but let me let me give you a sense of where these are distinctive categories, okay? You might have a, a calibration experiment. So it's trying to find the best uh, the best um, set of parameters that most closely mirror the, the uh, historic data, most closely match the historic data um, uh, in terms of model results um, compared to the, the historic data. So that's an experiment. Um, that experiment for each possible collection of possible parameter values, it might run several replications. Might, in other words, it might each simulation might run several replications because it needs to, for that particular set of parameter assumptions, it needs to get a sense of the mean value for those. So it gets a sense of the kind of the um, uh, the results uh, in a statistically reliable way before it compares it with the historic data. So here we would have a distinction between the experiment, which is the calibration control, and the simulation, which is the collection of runs associated with a particular set of parameters, and the replication, which is, is a, particular, a particular run with a specific set of parameters and a particular random number of seeds. Okay? So this is kind of the terminology. Now what makes this a little bit confusing, occasionally you'll see a bit of inconsistency 
basic, um, the, the most basic unit. Um, a simulation is the same as a, as a replication. Um, okay, so um, so in most any logic models which run ensembles of realization, the simulation is composed of only a single realization. Okay, so this is where Diana's question um, starts to get closer to answering Diana's question. So what's going on here? It's running the simulation. This this parameter variation experiment is running the model many many times, and it's summarizing the results somehow. Where so given that the main class is being created, it's living on its life and it's being destroyed, where is that data being accumulated? And it turns out it's in the experiment. Okay? It's, in this, it's in this experiment itself. And the experiment maintains something called data infectious 2D. Okay? This data infectious 2D is the 2D history that we just looked at. It, it accumulates this kind of bin. And what happens is um, that after each simulation run, after each realization run, in this case, of, of the um, model, so after each time it's created, made, run it, finished, with a particular random number of seeds, it salvages these results. It reads out these results. It sucks them out of the model. And, and then it puts it into, the, uh, into this uh, data set right there. Now, to, to address Diana's question, if you wanted to run this model many times, and instead of summarizing it over time, you just wanted to get the final value of it, what you would do is you would take this. This is the data set. Okay, I, sorry, oh, I, should, I should explain. Um, so you may see something very strange here, a word that, to which you're unfamiliar. Um, you see the word root? Maybe you can't see it. Um, so there's a word root there. Um, let's let's go um, on. Let's let's go here to um, this is under advanced within the Monte Carlo TD histogram, and you'll see this a thing called um, data infectious 2D. This is the 2D data histogram that we were just looking at, which we were just looking. This one here um, that we were just looking at. Um, which specified these intervals. And what we're doing is we're adding to it the data that's in this root.infectiousDS. Okay. Um, does anyone recognize this name, infectiousDS? What? Is it, and it lives where? It, where do we find that? The data set of infectives, and it's in? It's, it's in Maine. It's in Maine. Root is actually a reference to um, to Maine here. And in fact, if you go click over this, um, you will find it as normal. Helpfully selecting, use root, the root of the active object. Um, uh, so you'll hear the term root used by computer people quite a bit, meaning very different things in different contexts. In this case, what it's referring to is is a that the fact that your model can be viewed as a so computers computer scientists draw trees upside down um, it, this, this may may sound strange but it's true um, so so your model can be thought of as having main up here and maybe it has several subpopulations in it maybe there's a pop of people maybe there's a you know people maybe in, maybe city one city two um, City one, uh, city two, and city three, something along those lines. Um, and maybe there's a, just to spice it up, maybe there's a, a population of deer. Um, uh, and uh, and and then each of these collections may have several people, or maybe these have neighborhoods, right? This is really easy to do with any one. It's actually really easy to do this nice hierarchical model. So it's it's a thing of beauty. Um, and uh, I'm not sure deer have neighborhoods, but at home ranges, I, I don't know. Well, we won't, we won't conjecture too much, but maybe there's individual deer here. Um, and so we have maybe neighborhoods, and each of them have things. And, and from a computer science perspective, this is what we call a tree. Okay? Um, and this is how we typically draw it, um, although with better, sometimes with better artistic merit than this. Um, and, uh, and we call these the leaves of the tree, and this is the root of the tree up here. Um, 
so it's kind of natural that that refers to main. Now, the name of that class, it doesn't have to be called main. It could be called um, New Hampshire. Well, no. um, it could be called uh, some, other, some other name if you wanted to. It could be called, you know, um, uh, the global environment or what have you. The point is it's, it's functionally the root, um, the root of this whole hierarchy. And so it says use root to be the root of the object class. Um, so what is, what is it doing here? It's taking after the simulation is finished, after simulation run, it's extracting data from that simulation, from that data set, and it's adding it to this 2D histogram data set. Okay? So, Diana, if I wanted to rescue just that, you know, the, the last value in this data set or something like that, it would be, be very easy to do that. Um, uh, first of all, I think, I think in this data set, right, excuse me, in main right now, we even have a parameter, excuse me, a variable that tells us the number of, of people who are currently infectious. Is N infectious? So we can even just read that out, eh? So, so uh, I'm going to do something right now, uh, as I am wont, and um, and you don't have to follow me um, if 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 you're not um, up to it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a uh, a data set into here that's going to be called um, uh, final final um, uh, final uh, infection counts by by um, by realization or something like that. Okay, um, that's that's a that's a data set. Um, I'm just trying to respond to this question. And ah, look at that, Diana, a thing of beauty. So this says um, use completed iterations as horizontal. So it actually knows to tailor it. It's not saying use time. It realizes that this is not a, a, a situation where time would make much sense. It actually uses the number of completed iterations, the number of runs. By the way, this iterations is here. I think we need to just indicate the number of realizations that have actually, it's the number of simulations that have been run, which is the same as realizations here. And the because of the Monte Carlo model. Yeah, and that's because of the Monte Carlo model. But I, I have to say that's pretty impressive. That, uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't have, I thought I'd have to kind of throb it to do that. Um, Okay, so I was going to uncheck it because I thought it was going to be time and I was going to say, okay, use this instead. Okay, and the vertical value would be root dot and it's not going to prompt us. Okay, so it's N infectious. The question is, is it going to complain bitterly or is it going to be a happy camper? Um, okay, root cannot be resolved to, oh, look at that. Okay, um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, sorry, vertical axis value. I don't... I don't care about this, sorry. I'm gonna be adding this manually, so I don't actually need it to know. Because this thing doesn't know about root, only the, the in this other place doesn't know about root. So that's fine, we'll leave that blank. We don't need that. Do not update automatically, that's correct. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to update this thing here. So ladies and gentlemen, I just added that. I ended up not, um, not changing anything in it and um, and what I'm going to add is, is over here. I mean, I could have changed the number of iterations it, so, it saved, but I'll just do it here. I'll do di final, oh gosh, I should have named it um, DS to indicate that it's a data set, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that. Final infectious counts by realization. I'm gonna add this to there, okay? So, so that's the name of that, vari of that data set. And, oh, sorry, I don't want to do just like that. I want to do dot add, okay? And I can add this in, boop, 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 okay? Um, just like that. This, what is this thing? Wh why did I put that there? Where did that come from? What is, it's the, the number of infectious people, and what is root? It's main, it's, 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 the main that I've just finished running. Why is it that I've just finished running? Because it's right after this simulation run, okay? So I, so I add that in to this final infection counts by realization, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Okay. So, um, so this has, it's a good question. Um, and uh, this has to do with this distinction. If you don't check that, a replication will be the same as simulation. Basically, um, each simulation will be sort of a realization. And that's what we get now. If you check that box, you can have many, many replications per simulation. And that's, again, really useful if you are running a, um, a calibration where you want to be able to, for a given set of per parameter values. So, so in calibration, what are we talking about this? In calibration, you're trying to find the best set of parameter assumptions, uh, the set of parameter assumptions that best match the historic data. Okay? So often you know a lot about the historical data from the emergent behavior of the model, but not all of that data can be used to estimate parameters. Okay? So often you have some data to help you estimate parameters, but there's a lot of data that's more about the system different pieces of the system's emergent behavior over time. And you can't directly go to one parameter because it's influenced by so many things, by mortality and the duration of infection and, and maybe birth rates or immigration rates and, and you know people's contact patterns, all these different things mixed together in there. But you want the model to try to match that in calibration, um, to try to estimate some parameter values. Uh, a little bit like a nonlinear regression, but, but, um, but with some texture difference. Um, so to do that, you're going to try to find the best set of parameters to try to match that. Okay. It's not the only way, um, uh, but, but that's, that's one common way to do it. And for a given assumption about those set of parameters, like that alpha equals 1, beta equals 2, you know, gamma equals 3, um, you want to um, see how the model's results match that historic data. Okay? And you can be exploring different possible parameter combinations values uh, to see how well they match the historic data and select the best one is, is the idea for a lot of calibrations. Now, now to, to, to compare in that way, to compare the results obtained from a given set of assumptions about the parameters with the historic data, we want something that's reliable, that's not based on the vagaries of change that much. So we want to run this model many, many times with different random number seeds, maybe take the mean okay, over the so that we get out a reliable indicator of, of with that set of parameter assumptions, reliable indicator of what sort of the, the sort of mean values are there and compare it against the historic data. That's not the only way to do it, by the way. There's some problems with that. I'm just trying to give it up. Get, or that's, there's some things you want to think about whether you really want to do it that way. But, but that's one common way of doing it. And so if you wanted to do that, you would run many, for a given set of parameter assumptions, you run many replications. And maybe you'd run 100 replications to get a mean value for the result at, with those parameter assumptions, and you compare that against the historic data. Here, we don't need to do that. So we leave that re use replications thing unchecked. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, so here, uh, these two are the same. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Still. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, to to adjust the range on the uh, for the for the histogram. Yeah. Um. So where you go to is is the histogram two D. Um. So, da oh sorry, data infectious 2D. It's the it's the uh, histogram 2D data, and you'll notice it says uh, vertical intervals 40, uh, 40 of them from zero to 8,000. Data infectious 2D within the Monte Carlo. Oh, you go to the actual data. Data set. Yeah, because right, don't click on the on the actual graph. The graph the graph is derivative from the data set. The graph just displays the data set. So if, if you click on the graph, it says the associated histogram is such and such. And and then you have some further choices, okay? okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Okay. So, um, uh, so, okay, Dylan, though, you had a question. Yeah. So the question is, the Mm. 
Um, flat at zero. Well, it, it, it copies data from an infectious DS. Um, so so if, if you want to look into this more, what I would say is save that model as a separate model, reopen the example model, try running it there and see if you get that same thing. So then you'll know if it's something you've introduced as a change or whether it's something about your particular environment. Okay. Right. Right, so there's something along those lines. It would be fun to find out what that is. Um, but uh, Dylan, maybe you could compare. D do a diff on the two XML files. Oh, uh, yeah, I should have told you. Um, so, um, so ALP file, any logic stores its models in, in a file format. Okay. That file format is using a uh, encoding technique, a tag-based encoding technique called XML, Extensible Markup Language. It kind of looks like XML in the sense that it's, uh, sorry, HTML in the sense that it's a tag-based language. Um, uh, HTML being the language used to encode web pages and so on. Um, and actually, you could you could therefore browse with a text editor the model definition. And it's it's not incredibly um, uh, readable, but but you can kind of have a sense. It, it declares all the things that are in your model and and all the code is there and all the sort of and uh, some of you might find that useful. One nice thing you can do with it is you can use um, use tools uh, called um, diff tools or um, text tool comparison tools, source code comparison. So there's a there's an old utility on, on um, Unix and Linux called diff, but but there's um, there's uh, for instance if you're a Windows program there's WinMerge. Um, and, and these are great. I mean, these things basically allow you to succinctly compare two different files, see what's different. Oh, these three lines are inserted in this one, and the rest is all the same. Um, and it's very helpful sometimes. And if you want to see what's different, Dylan could do a comparison uh, in, well, if he's on a Windows box, WinDiv, um, or, or uh, Win, um, uh, WinMerge, to, uh, to compare those two. Um, Two files and essentially see what's what's different between them. What have you changed that might bear on this? And that's helpful. I think. So thanks for letting me know about that, Cheryl. Um, okay. So um, what we did is we added that thing in, and I'm just going to run this thing now. Um, the problem is that that this thing is out of the way, and I haven't had a reporting on it. So I'm going to drag this so that it's it's just above there, so I can see it at least. And um, and I'll run this. Boom. And um, hey, where is it? There it is. Okay, four samples, five samples. Okay, now that's interesting. Okay, zero, zero, zero. Well, here they've all gone to zero by the by the close of the time, eh? Um, they've all gone to zero by here, so no wonder they're 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 zero at that time. Does that does that make sense, Diana? Yes. So it's it's zero because by the time, at the final time, all of them, nobody's, infected. nobody's infected. Yeah. Um, if we had different parameter values, we might be able to have that. Um, um, yeah, we could uh, we could look at. So, how many people would like me to to to, to show how to do max? I could do that. Max, max, M A X. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so what you would do? What what would you do to look at the max? What you would do is you would go back to main because you wanted to look at the max over time, right? And and the key would be to sort of get over time what the max is. You're going to have to have some logic to do that. So you'd have a variable it's called max. Um, um, max max over time. And uh, a max infection counts over time or something like that. And, and basically what you would do is probably periodically you'd wake up and, and, um, and check. Okay, is the current count bigger than this? If so, if so, right to this, right to this thing. Now the question is how frequently you'd sample. Like maybe there's a spike super quick and you might miss it. But if you say you do it every day, you do that and it finds the, the count, you know, the day with the highest count and records 
that value. And then that value would be a main. And so then, in the experiment, um, it could reach in and grab that value and just add it in the same sort of way. So it would be actually pretty straightforward to do. Um, so uh, we're doing optimization uh, soon. We'll be doing a calibration. And uh, there was a guy I knew uh, when I was a grad student at MIT, um, which uh, he, uh, he was really into optimization. His, his thesis was about optimization of, of, of using models. And um, uh, a few years later, he had a child, and he named the child Max. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. It's, it's tr true story. Yeah, his sister's name is Wilby Min. Um, <laughs> Uh, could could well be. Um, so uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see my formative influences. Um, okay, so uh, birds of a feather flock together, I guess. Um, okay, so um, anyway, uh, let's let's continue to take a look at that. So moving right along, um, let's let's click on the um, this this chart here and. Uh, uh, this is the 2D histogram chart. We notice that in addition to saying draw its data from data infectious 2Ds, you, you have a choice between showing envelopes and showing bins. Right now it's showing bins. Let's, let's have it show envelopes instead, okay? Um, uh, show envelopes. And what this will show is instead the, the empirical fractiles around the mean, if, if, if there are those for whom that's, that's meaningful. What I mean is um, it shows what fraction of the time, um, uh, what are the intervals around the median, excuse me, um, within which different fractions of the total number of realizations lie for each interval of time. So um, in this case, our bins are defined right there um, within this, uh, within this uh, thing, uh, excuse me, within this 2D histogram further up. Um, I think it's data infectious 2D. You notice this is where the bins are defined. Um, excuse me, the, the envelopes. So what this is saying is that when we show envelopes, um, we should show um, those that uh, lie within sort of uh, 50, within which 50% of the runs uh, lie, and those within, I believe the way to read this is um, within which uh, 25% of the runs lie and within which 75% of the runs lie. And those are around the median, okay? Um, so, uh, so here, uh, I don't know if you can see this fringe, but there's uh, sort of an outer fringe here. You probably can't see it. But 75% um, of the runs lie within that. 50% um, lie within this sort of, I think there's, uh, excuse me, yes, um, with, uh, from sort of, uh, so for a given, for a given point in time, 75% lie, I think, within this and this, uh, and um, and then 25% lie within this, and 50% lie within, within this range, about the median, which lies within this. Okay, and um, that's another way of sort of summarizing the data, having to more, more to do with the empirical fractiles, um, sort of close and, and conceptually to, to, to quartiles, okay? So these are envelopes of empirical, um, empirical fractiles. And we could think of this as sort of a slice, slice into it would look like a box plot, which sort of shows the quartiles. Um, OK, so, so here, you know, you could slice through it, and, and you'd show, um, show this sort of uh, interval, um, these sort of intervals. Um, OK, um, and meanwhile, uh, bins would be more something like this. If we showed the bins, you'd actually get the histogram shown out for a given slice. You'd, you'd, you'd have a sort of histogram that looks something like that, which approximates some distribution. And the more and more you run it, the more and more well it will approximate the underlying distribution. OK. Um, OK. Um, right. Uh, so. So um, just looking at this, um, uh, there, there are ways of um, throttling this, uh, excuse me, of, of, of having this run with, um, with replications. If you, if you select replications, you can actually have it 
compute a varying number of replications such that the results are um, are consistent for um, uh, you, you achieve a certain level of statistical confidence in the results okay um, I should note that um, this this whole thing is a parameter variation experiment so we can actually use this to vary parameters and we'll, we'll show how that's done in, in, in a few minutes and if we want to vary those parameters in a way that that we secure results that are statistically um, uh, statistically meaningful if by taking means for a given set of parameters uh, over different realizations um, we may want it to run uh, a certain number of times to achieve a certain level of accuracy and I have some descriptions of sort of statistics associated with sample means and um, and basically uh, this discusses and I, I think I covered this more in another lecture so I, I think we'll have to come back to it but essentially um, you can have a, a specification of the number of replications you want such that you can have a certain level of confidence interval that the re result um, lies more than no more than a certain fraction of, of error um, within the of, of the actual mean um, but but I have a better explanation for that in a separate set of, of slides so I don't want to comment on that here yeah so when I'm in the same place yeah Yeah. Do do you have the, just this? Yeah. So if you check it, only th these only become relevant when. Yeah. Yeah. But these things uh, are contingent upon this. It would probably be better if it just grayed them out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So those are some comments on on uh, stochastic processes. Um, within any logic. Um.